Brookfield Zoo's Brain of Zoo to You. I'm Anne, the lead animal care specialist for large carnivores, and today we're going to talk about snow leopards. So today we're going to see Malaya and Ahava, a mother and daughter pair that were both born here at Brookfield Zoo. So we'll see what they want to do with some of their merchants that we've set out on exhibit. So hopefully they'll be coming out soon. They'll shift out from this far shift door on the far end. And sometimes they take a little while to come out because they're a little uh, hesitant to see like what's going to be on exhibit, what's happening, what are all the things they're going to explore. An interesting way we manage snow leopards here at Brookfield Zoo is that we actually have the dad here as well and his name is Buck and he came up from Philadelphia Zoo a couple of years ago. He's a really sweet male and him and Malaya are very, very bonded when they live together uh, when she does not have her cub with her. And so right now what we do is Buck has the exhibit overnight and then we bring him in holding inside the building our main big cat hallway in the morning. And then each time when we get the yard ready, then we then shift the mother and daughter out uh, in the morning and they have the exhibit all day long and then at night we bring them back inside. We do that just so the cub's not out overnight. When it's dark outside, we do have containment mesh on this exhibit, uh, but we prefer them, the cub to be inside. Plus, while snow leopards are designed to have really, really cold weather temperature parameters, it's actually, um, we like to have them inside just so it's not too cold while she's learning thermoregulation, she gets bigger. So they're finally coming out. They're coming over to check us out. They're very interested in people. They're very cued into their keepers, as I'm one of them. So they're, of course, coming over to see what are we doing and what's happening. We have a lot of enrichment out here on exhibit for them to play with. We put a new log on their bungee cord so they can use some of their prey response. They can pull that and use those big front arm muscles to pull on it. You can see we've got some chunk meat throughout the exhibit that they want to check out and eat. <clears throat> we put some fresh mulch out, some new substrates, some new smells for them to find in the morning to mimic if they were to find other uh, habitats and territories out in the wild. We have some perfume out here, some cinnamon scent. Um, you can see there's an antler behind them. That's actually a real antler uh, that someone got for us and we were able to autoclave them and use them with the animals. They have their Christmas tree that they've had for a few days now. We keep moving around. They keep still checking it out. So they are always kind of um, hesitant at first to explore some things. So snow leopards are the most elusive big cat species. They're very hard to find in the wild. They blend in very, very well with their habitat. And because they are the smallest kind of of the big cat species, they're also very hesitant. And they wanna check things out pretty slowly and work things out. They do have this patrol behavior that they do when they first come out. As I said, uh, their buck, our male, has this exhibit overnight. And so generally what they're doing is they're patrolling just to make sure there's not a male out here. They also like to make sure if anything's changed on the other side of the window, you can see Malaya looking right past me trying to check out if anything's changed on the public path. This is their territory. They want to be able to protect it and check out and make sure everything is okay and as they left it. And so now they're all set because they realize everything's just fine. And now they're going to check out this floor. They'll probably smell everywhere that Buck probably peed overnight. Um, they're going to patrol each portion of the exhibit just to check everything out. Some cool features while they're doing this and up close. This is great. We're going to be able to see. So <laughs> this is little Ahava on the right. You can see she's littler than her little mama. Her mom, Malaya, who's born for the Himalaya mountain range, which is where we can find snow leopards in the wild, she's weighing in at around 80 pounds right now. She's still got a little bit of her baby weight on her from when she gave birth to Ahava in, in May, so she'll get a little slimmer, although we do run them a little heavier in the winter so that they can handle the cold weather temperatures. And then that's little Miss Ahava in the front. She's quite sweet. She's weighing in at about 40 pounds right now, so she uh, was born in May. So she's eight months of age. The little cubbies stay with their mom until they're between 12 and 18 months, generally in zoos and in the wild. During that time, their moms can teach them how to hunt, how to find shelter, how to traverse all the different terrains that they have in the wild and in zoos. And so they can generally give them all their life skills that they need before they move on and find their own territory. Some cool things you can see, all those different facial markings um, that they have on them. That's actually how you can identify cubs really well and adults so you can tell the difference because they generally have different markings around their eyes, on their muzzle, around their face, and uh, even their nose color. So some snow leopards have pink noses, some have black noses, and some have speckles with a little bit of a difference. So sometimes we can tell them really well just by the color of their nose. As you see them walk away, you can see they have a different, a very distinct um, spot pattern. What's really cool is cubs are about one pound when they're born 
and they're actually born with all their spots already on their fur and skin and it looks like lines and really dark black solid spots but as they grow their body gets longer and bigger and then those rosettes spread out and they get wider and then they turn into actual spots so when Ahava was a little baby she looked very very dark gray with lines all along her back and now you can see that she's got all her little spots spread out like that Another cool feature, if you can see Malaya's tail is actually almost the same length as her body. And a cool feature of that is actually they use it to wrap around their face as a scarf uh, when it's really cold out so that their face doesn't get frostbite, especially that nose we just talked about. And then you can see they have really big fluffy feet. And that's so that they can jump around and locomote really well in these treacherous mountainous um, rocky habitats that they have. I'm sure you've seen uh, videos from National Geographic or different things that they leap and jump to take down a lot of their prey and they actually blend in really well with the rock work so that people and their prey can't find them or see them very well and so that's a really nice adaptation that they have for the wild as i mentioned we have containment mesh on our exhibit which is different than our other mode exhibits and the reason for that is they they can actually jump 25 to 30 feet straight up in the air from a standstill and that's so that they can locomote in their habitat and so Obviously here they can get all the way to the top of the rock work and so we have containment mesh here to keep them in the exhibit so they can also then get up really high where they like to be but still stay within the exhibit. And so you can see that they actually are pretty in tune to where each other are. Like I mentioned they're together 12 to 18 months uh, before they would go and find separate locations in the wild. And then at that time we would actually put Malaya and Buff back together. They're a really cute social pair. They like to live together quite a lot in zoos. Um, generally, snow leopards are solitary in the wild. They have very large mountainous range territories that they patrol and that they protect over time and they use to find their prey, uh, which is a lot of sheep, deer, and things like that, mostly small hoof stock, even some hares and rabbits and things like that. Um, and so we do, um, but here together, this pair just happens to like to live together with each other and so we allow that and it seems to do just fine. Um, you can see, like I mentioned, we have chunk meat throughout the exhibit. Um, because they're still not sure what's going on, they're not used to people right by their window um, having a video chat with all of you. They're still checking things out, but we use this for training. So we do a lot of training with our snow leopards to keep uh, care of their medical needs. They are uh, predatory and they're dangerous animals, so clearly we do not go in with our snow leopards. And so everything we need to do with them, we ask them to do voluntarily to make sure they're healthy and cared for. And so we actually train them to open their mouth and show us their teeth. They do stand up and show us our paw, their paws so we can check them out. Um, they're actually trained to go in a shoot for injection. So little Ahava was born in May, but she needed several rounds of booster vaccines, just like when you take your puppies and kittens or your um, adult animals to the veterinarians so they can get vaccines to stay healthy from things like rabies or distemper or the big cats here have the same thing going on so we like to give them vaccines to keep them healthy as well and so Ahava received vaccines just like a puppy or a kitten every four weeks until she was 16 weeks of age and she came out on exhibit and she's trained to actually let us give her those injections in a shoot um, so that it's uh, as easy and as pain-free as possible. And Malaya is the same. Malaya is also trained to allow for injections. And then when we move animals between zoos, like bringing Buck into our zoo, we actually train them to go into a crate. So then they can go in a crate and then they can just go out to their next receiving zoo. And so it's um, as simple and painless and as stress-free as possible. So we're not sure exactly what's gonna go on with the Hava. We do participate with the Snow Leopard Species Survival Plan. And so whenever they let us know uh, the best place for Ahava to go as an adult so she can have her own boyfriend and proliferate those species, then we'll make sure to um, participate with those plans and do that. That's how we brought uh, Buck in. So like I mentioned, Malaya was born here in 2015 and her parents were Sarani and Sabu, if you remember that great pair that we had here. Their first son, Everest, is actually Lincoln, Nebraska Children's Zoo. And Buck, our male here, his sister Rainey is actually there with him right now. And then if you remember, Malaya had a sister named Danya, and she's actually um, out at Syracuse, and she's had cubs as well. And so um, we're trying to participate with that species survival plan and keep those snow leopard population going. So this little cutie is our newest addition. Um, so we're so sorry that you're not able to see her right now. We do hope that you're able to come back and see her as she continues to grow old. She'll be here uh, for quite a while. 
in 2021, and we'll have her here with Malaya, her mama. You can actually see Malaya set marking her mulch, so she's making sure everybody knows this is her mulch in her area. That's what cats do, they set mark things. You can see her rubbing her face, they have scent glands on their face. And so she's leaving a scent on that uh, log when you saw her really rubbing her face on it so Buck will know she was here while he was inside. They actually can go visit him inside throughout the day if they want to. Um, she's licking the snow. They really love it when we have snow here uh, quite a bit. So we do allow Malay and Ahava to go in and visit Buck throughout the day if they would like to. There's a door that separates them, but they can go and chuff, which is a vocalization they mean that they make that's kind of like a high, um, along with all their other different vocalizations. So I'm not sure if there are any questions coming in that anyone has. Yes, we've got questions. Okay. So um, you said that the snow leopard's tail is as long as their body. Is that typical with other cat species or just with the snow leopards? It's pretty typical with all leopards. They use it for different things sometimes. A lot of times they use it just for helping them for stability when they're running or for to help make turns and directional. And so it's pretty common in leopards. Tigers have pretty long tails. Um, that are somewhat used the same. Lions, not so much. Um, but yes, it's generally that long in most leopards, uh, clouded leopards as well. And what's their typical diet like? So here we feed them several different processed meat diets. Um, we do a couple of options because uh, in case one of them is, is, becomes unavailable, then we don't have any issues with transitioning and new things. You can see I have a scratching her little claws on there. And that phlegm and response that you just saw from Alea, that's pushing air over the scent glands within her mouth. It's called flimmin. So other things about their diet, they also get a lot of bones to chew on for their dental health. Um, when they're uh, over a year of age, sometimes we offer them um, thawed um, whole prey items, um, like um, rats or different kinds of smaller prey items that mimic what they would have in the wild. Um, but it's mostly processed meat diets that are nutritionally complete, um, a couple of prey items, and then a lot of bones for their teeth. What's the purpose of putting scent in the exhibit? So um, it is, part of it is that if you use a perfume, it does actually mimic the scent of the other uh, sex in the species. And so a lot of times if you use a cologne or a musky perfume, females will think it's another male in their territory. So it just adds a little bit of mental stimulation. The same with scents. It's um, because they can't travel from one habitat to another and have different scents, we're providing that um, enrichment within this habitat that they have. Why are their tails so wide? Uh, they're so wide because they need them for leverage when climbing, but also, like I mentioned, to have that scarf um, at attribute in the winter. So in the winter, they actually have twice as much fur as they have in the summer. So they actually shed just like your cat and dog do at home in the summer. So they have a winter coat, which is kind of two layers of coat. And then in the summer, they shed one of their main ones out so that they're much less fluffy and they're much sleeker and slimmer. So that actually their tail will get much smaller in the summer when they don't need it uh, to wrap around uh, their face. Okay, so their tail isn't really that wide. It's just really floofy. It's very floofy. They have very fluffy pants, very <laughs> fluffy tails, very fluffy chest. You can see a hogger right there has a big fluffy chest right now. It kind of blends in a bit with the snow. But yes, because they can be out in the wild, out up to negative 55 degrees. They are built mainly just for being able to tolerate those cold temperatures. You can see they have very little ears so they don't get frostbite. That's similar to how I mentioned for polar bears, have very small extremities. Um, and so it's basically just meant for cold weather tolerance. Just makes them great to be here in Chicago where we have cold winters. So how cold does it get um, in their native habitat? Up to negative 55 degrees in general if they're at really high altitudes. So they live around 25,000 um, feet up, generally, in that altitude. They can kind of be anywhere. They mostly just stay pretty far away from people. So Malaya's finally finding some chunk meat and having a little bit of a snap. So that's good. They're kind of figuring things out. We'll see if they find some of these other ones. So because, um, oh, there we go. She found another one. So they are pretty high up in mountain ranges. Um, so it gets pretty cold, although it can, they can tolerate um, generally hot temperatures as well, because they are from India. Uh, China, different areas um, in the east. Ah, that was going to kind of be my next question that I was going to ask. Um, so what kinds of things do we do in the summer to help 
keep them cool? Or do we need to do anything to help um, keep them so cool? So a lot of what we do in the summer is they actually have an air conditioned folding. So they have their very own air conditioner unit to keep them cool along with a lot of box fans that we run. So anytime it's uh, really hot outside there, they have access to go into their air conditioned folding area. We do give them a lot of ice treats in the summer. So we'll put bones and different meat items in ice and then they can slowly eat those items as they thaw. Um, and then they have lots of ice. Um, and so generally we just keep a lot of fans on them and then we give them the ability to go in and out of an air conditioned holding. And also, can you remind us how long Ahava will be here at Brookfield Zoo with her mom? So we don't really know. We're gonna wait and see what the Species Survival Planning Committee lets us know. Generally, they are only with their parents 12 to 18 months. So she was born here in May. Uh, it, it would seem likely that she would leave sometime in the spring or next fall, but we really won't know until they let us know kind of the best place for her to go genetically and age-wise if there's any boys out in the country right now that are uh, looking for a girlfriend. She would generally go wherever it makes the most sense genetically to send her so we uh, keep inbreeding low, but then also have a good tolerance level, good personality matches as well. So I, I don't know for sure, uh, but I would guess uh, sometime maybe in the spring or the fall of next year. Um, as you can see, we, we kept Malaya here um, and her mother was actually recommended to go to another location genetically. And then, but Malaya's sister, Danya, went out as well. So we'll, we'll see what comes up. I would guess that we would like to keep Malay and Buck together to have a few more litters uh, while they're still young enough to have that. And so um, we'll have to see, we'll keep you updated. <laughs> so how much do the males and the females wear? Is there a difference? How much do they weigh? How much do they weigh? Um, it's a difference based on their body structure as well. So like I mentioned, Malaya's around 80 pounds, but she's kind of heavy right now from her birth weight. Ahava's around 40 pounds uh, because she's still growing. Obviously she'll keep growing until she's around 18 months. The dad, Buck, is actually a very structurally large male. If you guys have actually come out to the zoo and seen what a handsome boy he is, he's a very large male with a very big head. And so he's actually almost 90 pounds right now. So generally they're between 60 and 80 pounds as adults and the males are generally at least 10 pounds bigger but if you had a structurally small male and a structurally large female they might weigh about the same so looking at their ears they have um like the backs of their ears almost look similar to a tiger's they do so all big cats have those uh there's kind of two reasons one could be that then the prey doesn't know exactly where they are because if they look like eyes, then they could be um, a way to camouflage so they can, uh, the, so prey species necessarily won't know where they're at or um, different things. But also I've heard and learned that all of them have that so that when they're cubs, they can hide a lot of places and then when they twitch their ears, their moms can see them, but not a lot of other animals can. So it's actually a camouflage way but also an alert so that moms can keep track of their cubs in the wild because it is a quite distinct white line through the blacks of their ears. Do they have a pool? They do not have a pool so big cats, tigers are the only big cats that really like to swim. Jaguars will get into water um, as well especially for food items but in general cats do not like to swim and so they are not given a pool. Okay. Um, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to find okay. another question that I haven't asked already. <laughs> it's a fun feature if you guys come out to see us when the zoo's open, you can see we have all these trees in the exhibit. And that's actually something that Ahava, or that Malaya has taught um, Ahava to do and that she learned as well as a cub is that no leopards actually like to climb trees, just like uh, jumping 30 feet in the air they really like to be high and so they actually do climb our trees here they're actually trimmed down quite a bit now just so that the limbs don't go through the containment mesh in the summer and spring when they leaf out but it's actually a known fact that Malaya has always been quite an adept tree climber and she has taught Ahava quickly how to climb trees so oftentimes you'll actually see Ahava sitting up in the upper limbs of all these trees as they get bigger as adults it's harder, similar to like um, in the wild a lot of times, even if you 
see specials from Africa, you'll see leopards and lions sleeping in the trees, but as they get bigger, the trees generally can't support them and they're so back heavy that it's hard for them to get up in trees, whereas snow leopards, all, most of their strength are in their front limbs, and that makes them really, really good tree climbers. Hmm. Can you remind us uh, why they're pacing when they first come out in the mornings? So generally they just want to patrol and make sure that everything is as they left it. Since Buck has the exhibit overnight and they're inside, basically their habitat for them has not been protected or explored or defended for the entire time they're in holding sleeping overnight. And so they like to come out in the morning and just make sure that everything is all set and it's all good and that there's no potential threats or issues and that everybody knows it's their territory. It's very common in the wild as well for snow leopards to patrol their entire territory continually, making sure there are no predators, making sure they know where prey sources are, making sure they're far away from humans so there's no human predator conflict. And so it's a general natural behavior where they're patrolling and just checking out to make sure everything is all set and good. Um, and then that they can just see any changes that are happening on the public path. All right, I think we'll do one more question. Okay. Um, what are their favorite scents? Generally, we found that a lot of the big cats, especially snow leopards, like the sweeter scents like nutmeg, cinnamon, cardamom, things like that. Um, they're not as much on the spicy ones. You can't use any kind of onion or, mint or garlic with any cat species because they're allergic to them. So we never give any um, super savory, spicy, kind of things out on the exhibit. So generally the sweeter ones that you would cook with at home um, tend to be their favorite. Although perfume is a huge response, as I mentioned, because it does mimic the opposite sex. And so it does make them kind of search out breeding pairs. Yeah, so we hope you enjoyed our talk today about snow leopards. Um, and we hope to see you back whenever you can. And we appreciate your support always for Brookfield Zoo. We hope you have a great day.